Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the people that are here. We thank you for the blessings the church receives to continue the work of the Lord. And we thank you for the people here, Lord. Bless them and prosper them, Lord, and let them find you while they can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, so I'm in, the, I'm in the sermon series on Joseph. Uh, you know, we'll be, I'll be finishing this up uh, in the next few weeks, hopefully, uh, and then we'll get ready for the, uh, the uh, uh, Easter season, season of Lent, and I'll be uh, transitioning to, uh, uh, to a different sermon series. But uh, if you look on your bulletin uh, on the back of it, the, the, the title of the sermon is Pharaoh's Dreams, and what I'll be talking to you about today uh, are the dreams that Pharaoh had, and of course, the interpretation of those dreams. Uh, by Joseph. Now, this, this book is an extraordinary story about this, this young man, Joseph, and we know from an early uh, time that Joseph was favored uh, by his father, Jacob. He had many other brothers, but yet he was the youngest at the time, but yet he was the favored one. Uh, and we know and we've seen that his father favored him so much and loved him so much that he gave him, gave his son, this special coat. I call it Joseph's Technicolor dream coat because that's what Broadway calls it, right? So, uh, I don't know if that's scriptural, but uh, nevertheless, it was a coat of many colors. So I'm close, uh, you know, not far off. So anyway, so uh, Joseph gets this coat from his father, which signifies a lot. It signifies to the other brothers, at least, the brothers that are older than him, that Joseph is the favored one. And in fact, when Jacob dies, the father dies, Joseph may inherit uh, mostly all the other things. So of course, the brothers were not happy about that. And so the brothers formulate a plan to get rid of their younger brother. So if we get rid of him, you know, we'll get the inheritance and we'll have better standing with our father. So they, uh, first they're going to uh, have him killed, and then one of the brothers, Judah, says to the other brothers, listen, we shouldn't kill our own brother, we'll have blood on our hands. Let's just, uh, let's just, what's the next best thing? We could throw him in a pit, maybe he'll die in a pit, or we'll sell him out to slavery. So they sold him out to slavery, and he gets sold, and he winds up uh, with Egyptians. Now, the interesting thing is the province of God in, in, in Joseph's life, and if you look at your life, if you look at yourself trying to pursue God and follow after God, there's a path that you were on. You can look back at that path and say, oh, God was in control of that. God was in control of my life. God was in control of those circumstances, whether they were good or whether they were trouble. But you can see the hand of God in your life, whether it's in good times or bad. And we have to see those things by faith, right? Because we trust God and we have faith in God that whatever has happened along the way has been for our spiritual benefit if we could pursue God in that all. Now, a lot of things happen that aren't good and we bring it on ourselves, but you know, God could even bring good out of those situations when you're seeking after him. So that's the key to seek after God. And here's a young man of 17 years old, Joseph, that sought after God and never deviated from uh, his relationship with God in all circumstances, in good circumstances, and also in uh, troubled circumstances. So this Joseph gets sold into slavery, and I'm kind of summarizing the last few weeks. Joseph gets sold into slavery into Potiphar's house, who's the captain of the guard. So now we have this young man who wore this beautiful coat. It was the first coat that he wore, which what I call the coat of blessing. So he had this coat of blessing from his father, and that coat of blessing got him almost killed, sold into slavery. So he gets sold into slavery. Now he's wearing the coat of a slave in Potiphar's house. And Potiphar's wife, who's not a very good person, accuses Joseph of raping her. Now it just so happened that Potiphar was the captain of the guard. He was in charge of the prison, and he was in charge of all executions in all of Egypt under Pharaoh, a very powerful man. So the wife comes and tells Potiphar, you know, this Hebrew boy that you brought into the house tried to rape me. And then Potiphar, I don't think, is fully convinced with that, but he's very mad, and he throws Joseph in jail. Uh, and uh, while he's in jail, he interprets dreams for uh, a butler and the baker. And he interprets the dreams, and he says to them, God gives me the interpretation of the dreams, uh, Butler, you're going to be restored to your position, and Baker, you're going to be executed. And then he said to the butler, remember me when you get out of prison, because I've done nothing wrong to be here. So here we are at that point in the story where Joseph has been uh, languishing in a prison, a dungeon, for two years. And then this is what happens now. Pharaoh's dream. So if you turn uh, to the back of your bulletin, I'm going to read to you the story of Pharaoh's dreams, and then I'll explain this to you. And it's, it's part and parcel of the story, and really it's a very significant and important part of the story, because now it, it, uh, it, it, it thrusts Joseph 
into a, a position of power and authority uh, as a king. So uh, this is uh, Pharaoh's dreams. Uh, it's uh, Genesis chapter 41. When two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing by the Nile when out of the river there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows, ugly and gaunt, came up out of the Nile and stood beside those on the riverbank. And the cows that were ugly and gaunt ate up the se seven sleek, fat cows. Then Pharaoh woke up. He fell asleep again and had a second dream. Seven heads of grain, healthy and good, were growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads of grain sprouted thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven healthy full heads. Then Pharaoh woke up. It had been a dream. In the morning his mind was troubled, so he sent for all the magicians and wise men in Egypt. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret the dreams. Well, no one except, as we know, that Joseph will interpret the dreams. Now, an interesting thing is, if you did a little bit of research, and I did do a little bit of research into Egyptian magic, Egypt was filled with witchcraft, astrology, and magic. I mean, the black, black magic and the black arts, which were demonic spiritual forces. In fact, Pharaoh uh, was referred to as the son of Horus, who in fact, Pharaoh, they believed, the people believed, and he probably believed, that he was filled with magical power, a, a power that the Egyptians took very seriously. They were very superstitious, and they were mostly, most were uneducated, and they believed these things. And they believed that a force emanated from Pharaoh uh, and his clothes and any objects that he came in contact with uh, was a very dangerous force and lethal. But magic and witchcraft was a part of all areas of life uh, in the Egyptian life. I mean, they, they would believe healing and medicine was all magic. I mean, this was very, uh, a very dangerous uh, place to live. Uh, and certainly, uh, a Hebrew like Joseph, this would not be the select place to live in a place of witchcraft. Uh, but Egypt was filled with witchcraft, and witchcraft was a part of their daily life. You know, if you look at the world today, and you look around here, and you see all these fortune tellers and readers and horoscopes and all that, you know, that's really, uh, really uh, embedded in American culture and society. Uh, and you'd be surprised how many Christians, you know, read astrology or read the, go to the tarot cards, go to the reading. You'd be surprised that there's no, well, I guess we just talked about this a month or so ago with something like that, but uh, how a, a church would sponsor something like that or have something like that uh, as part of their uh, as part of uh, their outreach is just, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, we're told biblically not to have any part of witchcraft or magic or anything at all like that, astrology. I mean, those things are, there's a difference between astrology and astronomy, okay? If you, if you want to study astronomy, go ahead. It's very complex and it gets into physics and things, but, but astrology is not astronomy. And it's certainly not physics. So, but they live their life at looking at the stars and trying to interpret these things and have all this magic and divination. And, and really all it was were demonic spiritual forces. Let me assure you, it's almost like, do you remember every, you've all seen the Ten Commandments with uh, Charlton Heston, remember? I mean, we've seen that as, as kids and, and maybe the younger generation hasn't, but it's a wonderful tremendous story. I, I usually watch that movie uh, every uh, before every Easter, but remember when uh, Moses, you know, throws his staff down in the movie and, uh, and he's, uh, he's doing all these things, and then Pharaoh's men come in and they turn it into a snake. They've used their staff as a snake, and then Moses' snake eats right. Pharaoh's snake and all that. I mean, you know, th this magic, were, there were real demonic forces at work. So we can't underline uh, that that was going on. But the, this is the culture of which Joseph lived in. And the story of Joseph, if I can get to the points at the end, it's a very significant story, and there is application for us in our lives today. So what we have here is we have Joseph is in jail. He's been there for two years. And then Pharaoh has these dreams. He has these dreams about the cows, the seven cows, and he has the dreams about the seven grains of, uh, the seven grains of, of wheat. And nobody could interpret the dreams. And he calls the magicians, uh, all the, the soothsayers, and all these particular people that are, that are in Pharaoh's courts. They're magicians, and they're called wise men, which are like, um, it's kind of like a pseudoscience in a way. Because back in, in that day, they mixed astrology with astronomy. And it was kind of a weird mixture of things. 
So he calls all these wise men up, and they can't interpret the dreams. And nobody could interpret the dreams. All of Pharaoh's court could not interpret the dreams. And so uh, the butler remembers, hey, I remember when I was in prison, there was this young Hebrew boy in the prison that we had these dreams, and when we went to him, we told him what our dreams were, and he interpreted the dreams exactly as they were. So Pharaoh calls then for Joseph. Joseph comes in, and Joseph is very, uh, if you look at the words carefully, what Joseph says to Pharaoh, he's very wise in his words, and he's very wise in what he says. He doesn't say, Pharaoh, I can interpret the dreams. I'm going to do this. I'll tell you exactly what they mean. He says a few things. He says two things that are very interesting. He says to Pharaoh, what God has shown you, God is able to interpret. So he gave all the glory to God, even from the beginning, even in the sense, he said, that God gave you, Pharaoh, these particular dreams to make preparation for the future. And then, of course, Joseph interprets the dreams, and the seven cows and the seven uh, heads of grain, um, uh, they basically mean that there's going to be seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. And then you wonder why, why were there two particular dreams that seemed very similar in their way? Uh, was it necessary for God to give Pharaoh the dream of not only the seven cows being eaten by the seven unhealthy cows, but the seven good grains, heads of grain, being eaten by the seven uh, thin heads of grain? And we have the answer in Scripture that uh, the Bible says that the Lord did this to confirm that it would in fact happen. It was done, so it was confirmed by the Lord. And so these dreams become problematic now because... Uh, you know, there's going to be seven years of plenty and then seven years of fam a famine. So there was going to be an issue with, with the world at that point in time. And so uh, what happens is, is this, is that Joseph is brought before Pharaoh. He tells him these things. And then he says, uh, he says, Joseph actually gives Pharaoh the plan. So not only was Joseph wise in his ways because he had the spirit of the Lord. The Bible says the spirit of the Lord was upon Joseph. He never lost his uh, the Spirit of the Lord all through uh, the challenges and tragedies that he went through, all the difficulties he went through. He was a very faithful man all the way through all these circumstances. So when I look at Joseph's life, I say to myself, while well, Joseph had so much and then had nothing, uh, he was wrongly accused, he was imprisoned, he was separated from his family, uh, he had no future, people forgot him. What would you be thinking for two years? Here's a young man that had the Spirit of the Lord upon him, was chosen and specifically blessed in all that he did. Everything Joseph did in his life, he was successful with, and it prospered not only himself, but the people that he worked for. And then for two young, long years, God is silent. Do you ever think that God has been silent in your life? You're going through a situation and you're praying about a situation, or you're going through a difficult circumstance, and God is nowhere to be found, so you think. <clears throat> But he's always there. He, I would actually suggest to you, as Bonhoeffer said, uh, one of the great quotes that Bonhoeffer gave and one of the great explanations Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great uh, theologian, German theologian, gave was about the Holocaust. Uh, and people would say, where is God? How can God allow all this horrible and terrible things to happen? Well, we don't know in the province of God. That's in God's province why these things happen. And then they would ask the question to the great theologian, where is God in all of this? God's not here. And Bonhoeffer brilliantly uh, answered the question because he understood scripture. And Bonhoeffer would tell those people that God is precisely there in the concentration camps with these people that are suffering. And sometimes we have to remember that, that in the times of suffering, in the times of loss, when we think God is so far away, he's the closest to us. We just fail to understand those things. And we can all attest to that, that we've gone, all gone through difficult times in our life, but uh, did we sense and know that God is there with us? God was with Joseph for those two long years that he agonized in a dungeon. And who knows what was going on in his life when he was in a dungeon. Uh, but anyway, the two years went by because God saw fit that he would be there for the two years. And after the two years he came out, he interprets these dreams, and then Pharaoh was so overwhelmed that this young boy, this young man could interpret these dreams. And then Joseph tells Pharaoh, listen, we have to make preparation for these dreams. These dreams are going to come true. There's going to be a great famine in all the world. 
and the world is going to go hungry. We have to make provision. So Joseph says to Pharaoh, my suggestion would be take one-fifth of all the food and all the grain that happens in the, in the first seven years and store it away. And then Pharaoh thought to himself, who can I find with wisdom? Who can I find that has the spirit of the living God in him that could execute this plan, this plan of protection and sustenance? And look at the world of which Pharaoh lived in was nothing but witchcraft, idolatry, paganism, uh, and all this nonsense. And he was not about to put the life of himself, his family, and his nation of Egypt in control of somebody that was ill-equipped to do it. So he found the man that was cut out for the job, that was appointed by God for this job. And that man was this young man named Joseph. And Joseph then was put in charge of all of Egypt. He was given the signet ring of the king. Really, now Joseph is wearing the coat of a king. It's amazing. I put down all the coats that Joseph wore. And the first coat was a coat, I believe, of blessing when his father gave him this beautiful coat and singled Joseph out and said, This is my son in whom I'm pleased. And he's special. And he's going to receive benefit. And he's going to receive inheritance. It was a coat of blessing. But the coat of blessing got him in, uh, into slavery. Then the second coat that Joseph wore was a coat of slavery while he was in, uh, in, in the uh, Egyptian household as a slave. Then the third coat was the coat of a prisoner in a dungeon. Now the fourth coat is the coat of a king. But without wearing the coat of a slave and without wearing the coat of a prisoner, he would never wear the coat of a king. So in your life, when you're wearing that coat of blessing, enjoy the blessing. Enjoy that time of rest and peace and blessing. But if you're wearing the coat of a slave, you're wearing the coat of a slave. It's for a reason and a time. If you're wearing the coat of a prisoner, it's for a reason and a time. It's in God's province. This is contrary right now to the prosperity gospel that's being preached in all the world. They would say, never wear a coat of blessing you can always wear and should always wear. And yes, the coat of the king, you're all kings and queens. Well, you're all, all kings and queens in my book. But the coat of a slave, the coat of humility, or the coat of a prisoner, never wear that coat. That's not a blessing. Let me tell you this. Those times in our life are the blessings. Those times in our life is when God is real to us, and that's where we learn. We unfortunately don't learn on the mountaintop. We learn in the valley. We don't learn on the mountaintop. We learn on the valley. And that's precisely and exactly what Joseph did in his life. But now Joseph is in authority over all of Egypt. And now he's directed and authorized to put the plan in effect to preserve Egypt. But the key is this. While he's preserving Egypt, what is God preserving? Israel. He's preserving Israel. And we know that Joseph was elevated to this great status. And interestingly enough, he marries an Egyptian woman. And through that Egyptian woman, he has two boys. And those boys' names are Ephraim and Manasseh, the last tribes of Israel. So this whole plan of God is beginning to unfold. And I, I began to think to myself, wait, what are some of these issues that we can learn from the book of Joseph? I think the first, the first point is this, that Joseph underwent several trials in his life, wore four different coats, he was hated by his brothers, almost killed, sold as a slave, falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, and then imprisoned. And yet, through all those circumstances, he never lost his faith in God. Don't lose your faith in God through circumstance. A lot of people lose their faith in God. I had uh, lunch with, for some reason, I, I'm close with all my teachers. I, I guess they're very proud of their student. But I had lunch just a week ago with my chemistry teacher from high school. And uh, what a lovely man he is. And uh, we've kept in contact and I've done some legal work and things like that. And uh, you know, he, he lost his son not too long ago. And we were talking and he said, no, I don't, don't believe in God anymore. I don't go to church anymore. And my heart broke because he's a good man. And uh, we can't lose our faith because of terrible circumstances. And you're all going to go through terrible circumstances. But when that time comes, have faith in God. 
The second thing is this, that God leads and directs his people that search and seek after him. You may not have dreams, but, you know, God could work through dreams, but, but nowadays there's no, the, the interpretations of those dreams are scriptural. Re read the Bible. You'll find the will of God. People can't tell you what the future holds. Nobody knows what the future holds other than God. And if you listen to people that are telling you what the future is, they're misleading you. Even a blind squirrel gets a nut once in a while, okay? A blind squirrel gets a nut once in a while. Put your future in the hands of God. I would rather put my hands in the future of God and not know what the future holds. The third point is this, that we as Christians, we have to mature. And we have to realize that when we go through suffering and trials, we have to rejoice in that, as hard as that may be. Because through that suffering and trial, God is transforming us for eternal life. As difficult as that may be, I know scripture says, consider it pure joy. I want to get my eraser and erase that part out of the Bible, right? And consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds for doing that, that perseverance and suffering gives spiritual blessing. Very difficult to understand that aspect. But Joseph endured suffering and trouble. The fourth point is this, that it's interesting that as Pharaoh was confronted with the spirit of the living God in a pagan and adulterous witchcraft, astrology, in that type of world, in a, in a pagan culture, even in the pagan culture, he was confronted by God much like Herod was confronted by God when the star of Bethlehem appeared, right? He brought all his wise men in trying to figure out what happened with this and what star, what it meant. But even Herod, much like Pharaoh, was confronted by God. Fifth, you know, the world has one set of wisdom, and God's wisdom and God's plan is far different than the world. So when you see, I can almost assure you of this, when you see the world going one way, go the other. Mm -hmm. You'll be right most of the time. Today is Super Bowl Sunday. You know, football is a religion. Football is a religion in this country. And, I, and look at it as a young boy, I, you know, I would watch a game or two, my mother would tell you. But I've been healed of that. <laughs> Thank God. Those demons have been exercised. <laughs> You know, Giants aren't winning any Super Bowls lately. But, you know, football is a religion in this country. It could be four feet of snow. Well, actually, if it snows a little bit, let's say there's an inch or two of snow out here, nobody comes to church. But if there's three feet of snow in Buffalo, there's 80,000 people in the stands, freezing cold with three feet of snow, cheering for their team. You know, we need to have a little bit of that resilience as Christians, right? And finally is this, how do you as Christians respond to what happened in Joseph's life and how can you apply those aspects to your life? I think they're all good aspects that Joseph, Joseph has demonstrated to us a, 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 a character that had no flaws in it. And I think that we should emulate Joseph in the good times and in the bad times. And through that, not only was Joseph's life affected and his family's life affected, but a nation was affected. And we'll see next week how God, or the week after, how God preserved a nation because of one man's obedience. Because of one person's obedience, the nation of Israel was saved. So my question to you is, by your obedience to God, what ramifications could that have in the world of which you live? Look, at each one of you, we can easily fill back the church up. Just bring somebody to church next week, or for Easter. Church will be filled in one of any room. It's all it takes is a few little steps by all of you to change the world of which we live. Joseph did it, and Joseph's no different than us. He had the Spirit of the Lord upon him, and the Lord used him in a very powerful and mighty way. And God could do the same with all of us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we can come into your house and hear this beautiful story of Joseph and take those tenets of what occurred in Joseph's life and apply them to ourselves, that we may, in fact, do your will here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray.